The secret to being as healthy as possible to be your most vibrant self with more energy is to have the healthiest mitochondria possible. And there's three things specifically that you can do to achieve this, all of which have been scientifically proven. It's when you eat, as in intermittent fasting, what you eat, as in unprocessed food, and then exercise. Any one of these will improve your mitochondria, but two of these is better than one. In fact, it's not just an additive effect, it's a synergistic effect. And for maximum benefit, do all three of them. In this video, I'm gonna explain exactly what happens to your mitochondria as a result of when you eat, what you eat, and exercise, so you can understand what it takes to get your mitochondria as healthy as possible to have your best energy and stamina. Let's say you eat some food, eventually those macronutrients like carbohydrates, protein, and fat are digested into smaller molecules and the intestine absorbs them and they eventually make their way to the liver. So the liver cells receive all these amino acids, fatty acids, glucose, and fructose molecules and now it has to figure out what to do with them. To start, let's focus on glucose and how it enters our cells. If you think of a cell as being like a house, well your cell has certain doors that allow entry of glucose. These are called glucose transporter receptors. Insulin is a hormone that acts as the key to unlock the door, but the enzyme PI3 kinase is what determines how far you can swing that door open. Lots of PI3 kinase will open the glucose floodgates, allowing the cell to have a lot of fuel to power itself. What happens to that glucose molecule once inside the liver cell? Well, it depends on the cell's fuel gauge, something called AMP kinase. If AMP kinase detects that the cell has plenty of of energy based on high levels of ATP molecules, AMP kinase then tells the cell that it needs to store that glucose in the form of glycogen. If AMP kinase detects that the cell is low on energy based on low levels of ATP, AMP kinase tells the cell to break down that glucose into pyruvic acid so that it can then enter the mitochondria in order for the mitochondria to make the maximum amount of ATP. And this is known as the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle. One pyruvic acid molecule yields 28 ATP and this is the most efficient way to provide ATP for the cell. In this case, AMP kinase also signals to the cell to make more mitochondria in order to burn more glucose to make even more ATP. As it turns out, things that stimulate AMP kinase activity, like exercise and intermittent fasting, will keep mitochondria functioning optimally, as well as improve insulin sensitivity. But on the flip side, when a cell has too much ATP lingering around in the house, AMP kinase is shut off like a light switch. So mitochondria, they stop making ATP, and the cell has to figure out what to do with that excess glucose. Now if we're talking about the liver, so let's pretend this is a liver cell, or if we're talking about muscles, so we could also pretend that this is a muscle cell, that excess glucose is stored as glycogen but storage is limited. So if your glycogen storage is at full capacity, the cell's solution is to convert that glucose into pyruvic acid so that it can be used to make structural components of the cell. In fact, anything that impairs AMP kinase will drive fat synthesis and promote insulin resistance. In other words, excess glucose is bad, but excess glucose is a choir boy compared to excess fructose. You're a choir boy compared to me. A choir boy. When you're constantly eating, let's say three meals a day plus a snack or two, you're not allowing your AMP kinase to turn on for a long enough period of time. This is especially true when you consume too much glucose and then take into a whole nother level if you eat too much fructose. Same thing happens if you're not exercising, you're not allowing your AMP kinase to rev up for a long enough period of time. And you'll soon see how this impacts your mitochondria. If a cell has plenty of ATP but limited oxygen or mitochondria, it has the option to divide into two cells. If a cell has adequate oxygen and glucose, it may just keep things status quo. If a cell has low ATP and is getting old and run down, it may decide to die to make room for the new ones. This is called apoptosis. Mammalian target of rapamycin or mTOR is the holy grail molecule that determines the cell's fate. In other words, it determines if a cell will grow, maintain status quo, or die. The status of mTOR is highly dependent on the status of AMP kinase. So mTOR can only be turned on when AMP kinase is turned off. So let's say you're not eating and instead you're fasting or exercising. In that case, AMP kinase would be turned on and then mTOR would be turned off. In this scenario, the metabolic switch is turned on. The metabolic switch occurs once your glycogen stores are depleted and your cells then switch from burning glucose to instead burning ketones, which come from fatty acids. Glycogen stores depend on four main factors. One is the time since your last meal. Two is the amount of carbs that you've ingested. 
three would be the amount of exercise you engaged in, and four, the intensity of that exercise. Regardless, most people hit that metabolic switch about 12 hours from that last food intake. Once that metabolic switch is hit and you're now burning ketones, amazing things start to happen. During this precious time, cells conserve resources and activate genes that encode proteins that bolster the cell's resistance to stress. The ketones enter the Krebs cycle to generate maximal ATP. Meanwhile, cells reduce their uptake of amino acids and reduce the production of proteins that would otherwise enable cell growth. Also during this time, autophagy and DNA repair are stimulated, as well as the production of antioxidant enzymes. And all of this means that the cell becomes more resistant to stress. The longer you're in this zone of the metabolic switch, the more time you allow for these great things to happen to a certain point though where exactly is that point still to be determined but fasting for 16 to 18 hours a day seems to be the sweet spot but again it heavily depends on your glycogen stores when the fasting period is over and you start eating again the cells have already removed most of their damaged proteins and membranes the cells insides are now looking pristine fresh from their makeover. And now the cell has improved insulin sensitivity, so there is an enhanced ability to rapidly take up glucose and amino acids from the blood from that food that you just ate. The mTOR pathway is activated in response to food consumption, especially when there's a relatively high amount of amino acids that come from protein. The cell's response is to rapidly synthesize new proteins and membranes, thus enabling them to grow, and this includes mitochondria, and in the case of muscle cells, make them bigger and stronger. And this process is further enhanced by growth hormone secretion, which occurs in a pulsatile fashion. It's in a circadian rhythm and has a maximal release during the second half of the night. So if you're looking Looking to build muscle, it's crucial to get adequate amounts of high quality sleep during the night. Let's take a closer look at what makes mitochondria healthy or unhealthy. Once inside the cell, glucose is broken down into pyruvic acid in a process called glycolysis. Glycolysis releases only a small amount of energy, which is captured in the form of ATP, and you're left with pyruvic acid. From there, the pyruvic acid has one of two choices. The first option is to enter the mitochondria for further metabolic breakdown in what's called the Krebs cycle, which yields a boatload of ATP, as well as the waste product carbon dioxide which eventually makes its way to the lungs for you to exhale. The second option occurs when the mitochondria are either turned off, like when AMP kinase is turned off, or those mitochondria are overwhelmed from too much pyruvic acid, or maybe those mitochondria are dysfunctional from too much wear and tear from oxidative stress. So instead of the pyruvic acid entering the Krebs cycle, it's diverted to a process called de novo lipogenesis, or DNL, and that's the process of making fat. Specifically, it generates the fatty acid called palmitic acid. And when this happens, it leads to fat storage and other metabolic issues like insulin resistance. Both of these pathways of energy metabolism constantly release toxic byproducts inside the cell called oxygen radicals, aka free radicals. Now, if these bad guys are not detoxified, they damage all sorts of molecules. And if severe, cause the cell to die. That's why cells have another organelle called peroxisome, which houses various antioxidants so they can be released to neutralize those free radicals. Now you need ATP to provide the energy that's required for proper function and growth of cells. If those mitochondria are run down, they can't make enough ATP to support the cell. When this happens, you don't function well. You're tired and weak, but much like a car, you need your engine firing on all cylinders. Your mitochondria constantly need to be renewed and replenished. They need to divide and the cell needs to remove old or defective mitochondria. This renewal and replenishing process, it's basically like your cell's version of a massive cleanup after a big party. In your cells, this is called autophagy. Auto meaning self and phagy meaning to eat. So yes, technically the cell is eating itself, which is actually a good thing, but it's really a fancy way of saying your cells are taking out the trash and recycling its components. And when mitochondria specifically undergo this process, it's called mitophagy. What happens to those damaged molecules and mitochondria? They're transported to the recycling center or the recycling factory of the cell, and that's called the lysosome. Lysosomes are filled with acid and special digestive enzymes, which break down proteins into amino acids and cell membranes into their individual lipid components, like cholesterol and fatty acids. Don't forget that the mitochondria is an organelle with two membranes, so that includes those mitochondrial membranes. Lysosomes 
then release those amino acids and lipids to the rest of the cell to be used for the production of new proteins and new membranes. Autophagy plays a key role in healthy aging, especially in the brain. The brain uses more energy than any other organ. And that's why those cells have tons of mitochondria. And as a result, they develop tons of free radicals, which means lots of ensuing damage. We need tons of omega-3 fatty acids for healthy brain functioning, but they're especially prone to damage, which means even more cleanup in IL-6. And since our brain is encased in a skull, there's not a lot of wiggle room there. So your brain needs to be incredibly fast and efficient at removing debris. During sleep, the pressure inside our brain, meaning our intracerebral pressure, goes down, and this allows our glymphatic channels to open up. This paves the way for damaged cellular components, especially damaged or old mitochondria, to spill over into the bloodstream and then get carried away from the brain. So every night, your brain is literally taking out the trash, and if you don't get enough quality sleep, your brain starts to become a landfill. What happens when there's more trash in the landfill? Well, neurons start to malfunction. Your mood starts to take a dive, making you irritable or depressed. Anxiety, that worsens. You're tired, lack of energy, lack of motivation, cravings go up, lack of focus, your memory, it's not as sharp. So both autophagy and sleep are incredibly important for you to be firing on all cylinders. But the brain isn't the only organ that benefits from autophagy, they all do. This is why people who clear their mitochondria more efficiently end up living longer. If you want your cells to ramp up autophagy, you need to periodically have low insulin levels and periodically be in the zone, as in the metabolic switch zone. Based on the research that is currently available, the most powerful stimulus of autophagy comes from intermittent fasting. For example, it's been proven that intermittent fasting stimulates mitochondrial biogenesis and autophagy in the cells of the brain, heart muscle, and skeletal muscle. When people have sick mitochondria, they're metabolically ill. Sick mitochondria in the liver, you get fatty liver disease and insulin resistance. Sick mitochondria in the pancreas, you get fatty pancreas and insulin deficiency. In the hippocampus of the brain, sick mitochondria will cause memory impairment with Alzheimer's disease when it's at the extreme. In the hypothalamus, sick mitochondria make the appetite control center less responsive to insulin and leptin, so you end up eating more. In muscles, sick mitochondria makes you weaker with less endurance. The bottom line is, the sicker your mitochondria, the sooner your cells start to die. And this programmed cell death is called apoptosis, and that's when the cell shrinks and it doesn't spill its guts onto thy neighbor's cell. Now, the health status of the mitochondria actually determine whether a cell undergoes apoptosis. For example, in animal models of stroke, intermittent fasting can protect neurons from dying by apoptosis by essentially boosting mitochondria by increasing the number of healthy, well-functioning mitochondria. Intermittent fasting accomplishes this by promoting mitophagy and biogenesis, and this is how it does it. If old or dysfunctional mitochondria are not disposed of in a proper, efficient manner, well, they can kill cells or promote cancer because they generate more than 10 times the amount of free radicals compared to healthy mitochondria. Free radicals destroy or alter molecules, which leads to cell death. Free radicals also cause mutations in DNA. So if a mutation occurs in a gene that encodes for a protein that's critical for apoptosis, then that cell may survive and accrue additional mutations that result in uncontrolled proliferation, and that's what we call cancer. One specific way that intermittent fasting promotes mitophagy is by stimulating the production of the mitochondrial enzyme called SIRT3. SIRT3 improves mitochondrial ATP production. It also enhances the removal of free radicals and it stabilizes mitochondrial membranes. Once those mitochondria are messed up beyond repair, they're disposed of in the recycling center and need to be replaced with brand spanking new ones. And that's called biogenesis, which happens during the metabolic switch. This study looked at the effects of exercise on mitochondrial size and function. The mitochondria on the left come from women before they trained for six weeks where they did both aerobic and resistance training. The right side shows mitochondrial size afterward. Notice the increase in size. Many of the beneficial responses of cells and organs to intermittent fasting are the same that come from exercise. Resistance training, aerobic exercise, 
and high intensity interval training have all been shown to improve the cardiovascular system in the same manner as intermittent fasting. One study found that every other day fasting results in reductions in heart rate and blood pressure, as well as an increase in heart rate variability. When you look at neurons, as well as cells of the heart, skeletal muscle, and liver, both regular exercise and intermittent fasting stimulate autophagy, mitochondrial biogenesis, and DNA repair. So it's no wonder that both regular exercise and intermittent fasting improve glucose regulation, fat burning, and brain function, as well as protect against a wide range of age-related diseases and improve longevity. Doing both of these has a synergistic effect to further enhance all those health benefits. Now take a look at this picture, which comes from a study done in rats who did the combined intermittent fasting with high-intensity interval training, had better glucose tolerance, lower insulin levels, better endurance, increased muscle mass, and increased mitochondrial mass. Also, this group had the lowest plasma oxidative stress markers. Okay, that was in rats, but what about humans? This study, done just this year in 2022, looked at 36 overweight women, and they split them into three different groups. One group did high-intensity interval training alone, the other did just intermittent fasting, and the other did both. Not surprisingly, the best results came from the group that did both. They lost body fat, they increased their fat-free mass, meaning muscle, and they improved their strength and physical fitness. We talked about when you eat and intermittent fasting. We talked about exercise. And what about what you eat. Your mitochondria are hugely impacted by what you eat, for better or worse. And what's the number one molecule that causes mitochondrial dysfunction? Fructose. Fructose to the mitochondria is the equivalent of putting sugar in your gas tank. It's only a matter of time before that engine is toast. Take a look at this picture, which shows different sizes of mitochondria. The researchers in this study showed that when fructose was added to the diet for 10 weeks, it decreased mitochondrial size, as you can see in the middle pictures. The researchers also showed that the fructose diet caused there to be impaired mitochondrial dysfunction with less protein acetylation and fatty acid oxidation, which led to metabolic dysregulation. So mitochondrial function, it worsens when eating excess sugar and trans fats, and to a certain extent, some saturated fats, mostly the long chain saturated fatty acids that come from beef and pork, like palmitic acid and stearic acid. But by far, the worst offenders are fructose, which mostly comes from added sugar, and trans fats. What is it about that fructose that impairs mitochondria? It's a few different things. Excess fructose generates excess uric acid and palmitic acid. When you have have excess uric acid in the brain, that generates inflammation, as does excess palmitic acid. Whenever there's inflammation, you're going to have increased oxidative stress from those free radicals with subsequent damage to mitochondria. Excess fructose, it also directly causes damage in the brain by means of glycation and oxidative stress. Not in neurons per se, but in the cells that nourish those neurons called astrocytes. Glycation is the mired reaction, which is when fructose or glucose combine with the amino acid portion of a protein molecule. So this ends up generating advanced glycation end products, or ages, which causes cellular dysfunction. Fructose engages in that mired reaction seven times faster than glucose and generates 100 times the number of oxygen radicals, causing oxidative stress. When those mitochondrial engines start dying, cells start to die. And this is what happens with every chronic disease. So I like to think of mitochondria as being powerful like a V8, but only durable if you take care of them, as they tend to go defective with time and are very prone to oxidative stress and damage from free radicals. All in all, most fructose and glucose consumption comes from added sugar. Adults should eat no more than 25 grams of added sugar per day, the less the better. Whatever else drives inflammation will also drive oxidative stress and therefore worsen mitochondrial function. For example, when eating a processed food diet, the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is about 20 to 1. This ratio is too high and it causes low-grade inflammation. But when eating unprocessed food, that ratio is about 1 to 1, so it's important to consume foods that are high in omega-3s, things like salmon, eggs, walnuts, flax seeds, hemp seeds, and chia seeds. You also need to consume adequate amounts of antioxidants to fight off all those free radicals and oxidative stress. So fruits, vegetables, whole intact grains, seeds, nuts, 
that's where it's at. Most people don't consume enough soluble and insoluble fiber, which should be about 25 to 30 grams per day. And most people get about 10 to 15 grams per day. Now fiber is the most underrated nutrient for a hundred reasons. Insoluble fiber dramatically slows digestion and absorption of what you eat. And this results in lower and slower insulin secretion from the pancreas. When it comes to soluble fiber, that is metabolized by the bacteria in the gut. And this produces butyric acid, which is absorbed into the bloodstream, which has an anti-inflammatory effect. And in that sense, it indirectly helps your mitochondria function at their best. So great sources of soluble and insoluble fiber include whole intact grains, fruits and vegetables, legumes, nuts, and seeds. Also, now, when you eat unprocessed food, you naturally consume plenty of fiber, omega-3s, and antioxidants that naturally keep sugar and the bad fats to a minimum. So, if you want your best mitochondria possible, intermittent fasting, eating unprocessed food, and exercise. Don't you want to look like her? Which one of these drawings in this entire video was your favorite? Maybe the one that gets the most upvotes in the comments? Well, I don't know, maybe I'll get a frame for something like that. Put it right here. Nah, I won't do that. And if you like this video, you'll probably like this one as well. It's how you can overcome your hunger problem when starting to do intermittent fasting. And I'll put it right here so you can click on it right now. Right now.